Chapter 2, A Soldier's Job Dogen Ronda The Canellan Palace was particularly loud today, and not even the echoing of the guards' footsteps across the halls could overpower the crowd's noise. Here in the chamber, several floors above the main lobby, the cacophony was even stronger. The receiving area was packed, which added to the unrest inside the palace. When Wynne became the emperor, he moved the receiving rooms to higher floors to discourage people from seeking an audience with him. It worked for some time because it was mostly the elderly wanting to contest their funds who wanted to meet with him. But lately, things have been changing. These people in the receiving area were mostly from the south who probably wanted to ask for bigger parcels of land to farm. The weather was miserable, and a more substantial piece would at least allow most farmers to amass a greater share come harvest season. There were also some merchants seeking protection from the palace, who brought with them chests of gold to offer as gifts to the emperor. I liked this part of the palace because it was the only place that didn't discriminate between the people's ranks. Here, the rich sat with the poor, and everyone breathed the same air. The large windows on the opposite sides of the room afforded a magnificent view of the moons, Luna and Risa. Today, no clouds hid the moons, which meant that the temperature was slightly hotter than most early evenings. The windows were added not to impress the people with the moon's majestic view but rather to swelter them into losing their patience as they waited for their turn to speak with the emperor. McQuinn's storm was unquestionably cunning, I had to give him that. A man with a tan face impassively watched the soldiers. From the way he was dressed, with the collars of his shirt folded down and the sleeves rolled up to his biceps, I guessed that he was a farmer from the south, maybe Rudia or Dirella. Dirella was my province, and it lies in the south of Achaea. It is surrounded by water on almost all sides except for a portion that connects it to its nearby province, Bulaknin. In Dirella, the land was fertile, and so, agriculture flourished. There was a vast body of water on one side of Dirella, and so, fishing thrived as well. Because of this, I never have to worry about my old man there. He made enough on our farm to sustain himself and mother and still shell out some more to help relatives. When I was smaller, or rather, when I was younger because I didn't reckon ever being small in someone else's eyes, I was glad to be in Dirella. But as I grew, with muscles building up in my body even if I lazed around all day, I thought that I could do something better with my life than swim the oceans, catch fish, and till the land. I was constantly teased because of my looks, and well, the moon turns had not been kind to me either. No girl ever dared look at me twice, and the boys didn't want to have anything to do with me. They were always much smaller than I was, so they couldn't bully me, but they never befriended me either. I tried to be sociable, but it didn't work either. When I was of age and was brought to the Canellan Palace to present my power to the Emperor, I was awed by its grounds. Two eyes that only ever gazed at the greenery of the fields, the palace's red bricks and white walls came as impressive. I knew then what beautiful meant and how it felt to revere something so pretty. Like Lamare. I smiled to myself as I thought about her. If ever there was one good thing that happened to me when I went to Canella, it was meeting her. She reminded me of someone, of a memory or a dream, perhaps. I wasn't exactly sure which. The memory was so faded in my mind that sometimes, it felt like it was only a dream. And honestly, as the days went by, the more uncertain about that memory I became. In my dream, a long time ago, I was a stable boy in love with a beautiful princess who was married to McQuinn Stormaren. And when I met the princess, my life changed altogether. It was only a stroke of good luck, but meeting the princess gave me a chance to talk to McQuinstorm. I managed to save his life in that same dream, making me worthy of being taken on as a palace guard. Now, an awful lot of moon turns later, after McQuinstorm became the emperor, I have earned a post to be one of his personal guards. I got to be where he is, have access to what he knows most of the time, and gain a few special privileges. It still didn't help me with the ladies, though, but at least I was respected by the men. I was not familiar with the ladies, though. Never understood them. And never reckoned I ever would. I would rather spend the days out on the battlefields, engaging in wars or protecting the emperor during his visits to the other provinces. But put a woman in front of me, and if she batted her eyelashes, I would likely grin like an idiot. If she were to smile, 
that would be lovely for me, but you know, with this cursed face, she probably would have run far away before realizing it was a man who smiled at her and not an ogre. The weather was humid again, and I longed for the rain that the emperor usually brought. His power could craft a storm, and I could only imagine his satisfaction and his pride in it when he did. In my dream, the first time I met the emperor, he asked me where I found the princess. Some of the memories of that meeting were muddled in my head. Sometimes, when I close my eyes, it's Lamare's face I see, but I know I got it wrong. She wasn't the princess of Akia. Anyway, like I was saying, I was telling the emperor about the story of how I found the princess, how she wanted me to saddle a horse, when out of nowhere a whip lashed against my back. My mouth hung open in fascination. When I continued and blundered again, I felt the whip. What an odd dream. How omnipotent the emperor's power was. If I had something as potent a power as his, maybe I would be the one sitting on the throne right now. The emperor can also summon storms. I had not seen him control water directly like in the creation of waves, but he could make rain fall in buckets and floods rise. It's scary, and I should fear him when he lashes out and storm clouds gather in the sky. Admittedly, my chest stirs, too, whenever I disagree with palace circulars. Maybe, there's also a trace of hatred in my heart towards him. Then again, he is charming, and I couldn't bring myself to hate him altogether. It's a tough emotional battle, being so close to the emperor and all. When the emperor rose to power and replaced Northsome, part of the former emperor's ability to charm was passed on to McQuinn Storm, a testament that Northsome selected the new emperor without prejudice to the people and that in bestowing upon the new ruler part of his power manifested his trust to the successor. In that way, the emperor would always be unique. He would be known as the only one who had more than one power across Achaea. He would have three, his own, the one passed on by the prior emperor, and the power to age wine. The last was needed in performing duty during the Akin Wine Festival, a celebration on the full turning of the moons, to continue the traditions of presenting children and ordaining them as citizens of the land. There were tales of an old power, shuffling, but it was a power long gone. Probably lost to everyone together with the lost dragons. I only learned about shuffling when I was a child, in school, we also discussed it. It was said that shuffling meddled with whoever manifested it because it allowed the citizen to absorb the power of the people around them. It was called shuffling because, when mastered, the bearer could shuffle among all the powers he or she had absorbed. Its limitation? Without mastery, the bearer would have difficulty knowing what power he or she possesses. This was unfair, though. Why would anybody be allowed to have three different powers when some citizens only have pitiful ones? Wait until your name gets called, Bonilanto said. I watched as the tall soldier pushed a man back to his seat. Boni, I said. The palace guard looked at the man one more time before moving towards me. When he was beside me, I whispered, I told you not to touch the people. We are soldiers of the land. Our commitment is to serve, not to use force on them. Boni frowned. What good is power if we can't use it to make our jobs easier? I stand all day listening to complaints, he said as he pointed to the people crowded in the sitting room, waiting for their turns to raise their concerns to the emperor. And what about us? Huh? The emperor doesn't care enough to replace our battered armor. I smirked. Our armor had seen moon turns of fighting, and they were sent to the blacksmith more than I could ever count with my fingers and toes already, but they were usable and could still preserve our lives. There are more important things that Akia needs aside from our new armor, I said, although I only half believed it. You're wrong, Dogen. If we get killed in battle, Akia would not be able to hold off against any rebellion. Who said anything about rebellions? I asked. Voni blushed and mumbled something incoherent. I'm loyal to the emperor, and I'll fight with him to death, but I wish that sometimes he would put more importance on our needs. Why do you keep on talking about battles? No citizen would dare raise arms against Canella, I said. Where have you been? Haven't you been paying attention to what's happening around here? Aren't you curious about what these people are doing? Those who are not requesting larger portions of land are here trying to seek refuge in Canella. I say there is no place for them here. 
If the capital is filled with vagrants, we won't be able to defend the place. These people are ignorant in battle, and I don't want to be the one tending to them or teaching them to figure out one edge of the sword from the other, he finished. Battles? I have not heard of any. Are you sure about this, Boney? I asked. Dirella. That's where the first hand that lifted the sword came from, and the gods only know what's happening in that province now. I'd like to believe that the emperor has no hand in the matter, but it's been days, and the province is rumored to have been flooded, he paused. Gods help us in case the waves from the ocean come crashing in to add damage to what the floods are already causing. Now I understood why he was taking it out on the citizens who sought an audience with the emperor earlier. Boney was short-tempered, and he wasn't good at hiding his emotions. Flooding in Dirella? Impossible. Why was there no announcement across the land? Up until now, I didn't believe in plotting. That some lords and generals schemed to ensure that power would be theirs for keeps. I've always believed that there's a spark of goodness in people. I could only pray to the gods that I was right. Dirella is where the first sword was raised, but where else? Do you have any proof? I asked skeptically. Ghosts of Nivedon. Some say the ghosts have risen. I don't believe it, though, so I think it's only Dirella. Boney's eyes widened for a while as though he had come across a realization. You are from Dirella, aren't you? Have you heard anything about rebellions there? He said, pointing a finger at me. Put your finger down. I dislike being pointed at. What business is it of yours? Surely, you'll have the most desire to help your people. There is no advice from the palace. I can't leave my post. But with your frame, you can swim through the floods and save lives, perhaps carry more than a boatload could ever save. He said it without intending to be mean, but I grimaced because I didn't like to always stand out, especially if it had something to do with how I looked. My place is with the emperor. My oath is to protect him, not to swim back to my hometown and waddle in mud. Boney's nose flared. Have you no compassion? With that attitude, I would certainly say that it's the mud you belong to, he spat out. He turned away from me, and by then, my patience had reached its limit. I raised my right arm and hit him but missed. Boney looked back at me. Don't do that again, he hissed before swaggering away from me. I hated his power or maybe envied it because he had the reflexes of an animal. And I do mean an animal like a tiger or a lion. He could feel a punch coming even with his back turned. I wished my power was something like that. Boney went back to his post, his face sourer than it had been earlier. The chamber doors opened, and Tehran Ariger came out. His white hair was cropped an inch tidily above his ears. He was old, but he was still a strong man and his wisdom was unmatched in Canella. That's why he was the emperor's advisor. Rumors kept floating among the guards that the elders' guild had been sending him invitations to join them for the past five turns of the moons but that he had persistently declined. It is with the palace's sincerest apologies that the emperor cannot see anyone anymore today. Urgent news comes from the south, and the war chambers are now being assembled. Please come back next week. The crowd fell silent at first, but then angry curses erupted. The people did not like having to wait for nothing. No one ever did. I was surprised that the announcement came from Tehran. He's held a high position in the palace, and he shouldn't be wasting his time for menial announcements like this. I rushed to the crowd to help Boney and two other soldiers at the station. Hands pushed at me, and the cursing only got even louder. From the corner of my eye, I saw Tehran as he entered the chambers to join the emperor and the other war generals. I had to get back inside, too. The emperor would look for me, now that there's a matter of utmost importance to discuss. I braced myself and shouted, Please, citizens, the emperor shall attend to you sooner. But for now, you have to wait patiently. Roam the streets of Canella. It is a wonderful place. Come back next week as advised. There will be time for an audience with him by then. There was silence. Then it was broken by a woman's shriek. Goodness! What are you? That was the cruelest thing I ever heard anyone say to me. Oh well, not the harshest, but it was definitely rude. Go back to your home, 
madam, before the emperor decides to ask me to chase you away, I said in my lowest voice to make it sound scarier. Boney looked at me for a while, and when he saw that I had silenced the woman, he followed my lead by talking loudly to the visitors, scaring them if needed. The other two soldiers did the same. When the crowd had thinned, I went inside the chambers to join the meeting as the emperor's human shield. There was a side door, an almost unnoticeable passageway out of the chambers, and I passed through it, knowing that it would lead me to the war chambers. This is not the time to help them, an old general said. The emperor looked thoughtful. This is exactly the time to send support to Dirella. The people are drowning. If more than half of them are lost to the flood, we will have difficulty trying to grow our land. Akia needs people. Able-bodied citizens to serve us. To produce. To guard. Half of them dead means half of your enemies are dead too, your grace, the old general said. I stood back, listening to all of them. Maybe if I had listened enough and remembered their strategies in the past, there would come a time that I could lead using my brains, instead of just courage and brawn, in battle. These people are Akeens, they are our flesh and blood, and I say if there's a fire, it had to have started somewhere. There was Flint, and from Flint, who's to say that it couldn't turn meekness into a potent outrage? Said a middle-aged man who went by the name of Paterno Ronaldo. He had a potent beard and a wide jaw. He was brave enough to look directly at the emperor. Emperors have strategies. There is always a need for balance. If nobody ever felt vulnerable, what would make Akeens realize that they need my rule? So in this instance, a few days of lolling under a blanket of storms will make them pray for the Canellan Palace to send help. As it is our duty, your grace, Paterno interrupted pointedly. The emperor looked grimly at Paterno, and the group fell silent. Charm. The emperor used his power to get the war generals to his side. The palace will be there for its people, the assistance we provide de Relins, a proud bunch these people are, will make them remember that they can't stand alone. The swords that were raised in that town have to be bent, trashed, and washed away with floodwaters. I can't let them doubt my leadership, the emperor finished. Paterno did not say anything anymore, but I could see his eyes were still lit with fire. A wise man for knowing his limits as to how far he could question the emperor. What is it then that you are commanding us to do, your grace? General Renner Colo asked. He was a young general and was remarkably good in battle. Word had gotten around that his power lay in how he swung his sword. At his age, he had always been successful in stopping uprisings, and under McQueen Storm's rule, there had been a lot. I couldn't remember if it was like this during the former Emperor Northsom's. No rule was without its flaws, but McQueen Storm's and Northsom's rules were so different that it was like comparing apples and oranges, then peeling off their skins and comparing them again. You will lead hundreds of soldiers to Durella. You will march by midday. Assemble your men and bring Durella back to me, the emperor said. Paterno didn't say anything. The other generals gave their consent. Thank you, your grace. It is an honor. I will lead them, General Renner said. Dogen, the emperor said. I looked at the emperor, shocked that he addressed me even when I wasn't joining them at the table. Yes, your grace, I said. Aren't you from Durella? Yes, your grace. You will join General Renner and help him bring your fellow Durellans to my feet, he said. General Renner took one look at me. There is no need for this, your grace. This man will only scare people. I know the way. I can bring them to heal. Nonsense. It is said that the ways of a Durellan are only truly known to a Durellan. They are an eccentric lot. You will be grateful when you realize that I'm right, and I always am, the emperor said. I knelt by the emperor's side. Your grace, my place is with you, I said and continued in my head, and with Lamare. If I were to go to Durella, I might miss Lamare's visit in the coming fortnight, and no one should be allowed to take a man's only happiness away from him. I can manage without you for a while, Dogen. General Renner will need you, the emperor said. This time, his tone had caught on an edge. He didn't want me to plead my case. Oh, 
Lamare, I thought. So, I guess I will not be seeing her this fortnight. To serve, your grace, I said and stood up. Wynne dismissed everyone, and General Renner walked fast towards the door. You will not slow me down, Dogen, he said. I replied to him with only the words I thought appropriate for me to say. I'm not slow, General, I said. Never have been. He frowned. Let's go then. It has been two days since the flood started, and I want to save as much of Derella as I can when I get there. Meet us at the gates in thirty minutes, he said, before turning to me again, adding, and please, would you mind getting a haircut and a shave? I mulled it over inside my head. Thirty minutes for a haircut, a shave, and to prepare my things? Well, that's going to be a challenge. But I would give the general that. Besides, a new haircut may be what I needed to make Lamare notice me. Could I ever pull off a top knot? I didn't think so, and yet here I was with one. At least it would be easier to maintain. I ran my fingers down my chin and felt stubbles already. How could it be? It's just been minutes since I ran the blades of my dagger against my chin. I trotted my horse and found a throng of soldiers huddled near the canal and gates. General Renner was approaching with a bannerman. Really? To rescue people, there had to be a banner? I snickered. Everybody stood up, and some ready to ride their horses. Soldiers, our goal is to reach Girella in two days. We will ride hard. Anyone who wishes to leave may do so at the cost of your honor, he said, looking around. Are you ready to save Durella? He rallied the men. The men cheered, and there were rustles as soldiers rode their horses. The general moved in front of the formation and started galloping away, the bannermen closely following him. Goodbye, Lamare. Hello, Durella. Time to become a hero.